I would now like to introduce to you uh, Ryan McGinnis. That was um, sufficiently aggrandizing. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll take that. Um, I'm going to give the presentation with my mask on so that later we can overdub a professional voiceover actor <laughs> and clean up the talk. Uh, <laughs> that's not true. Um, but I am going to dedicate the talk to Miss Gina Kim, who um, has worked with me for over 15 years in my studio, and she runs the studio, and um, I would be completely lost without her. I know it's um, maybe even inappropriate and uh, silly to dedicate a talk to somebody, but coincidentally, today is Gina's 40th birthday. <laughs> and, <laughs> And I, I trust she's actually not watching this remotely. Um, she has taken the day off. She's, she's taking a personal day. Um, but the real point is that I think this counts as a gift. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a lot to share with you, and I'm going to do it in these three sections. Um, I'll give a very robust introduction to my work where I'll um, share with you my love of symbols and primarily the body of work that I call the mindscapes. And then we're gonna go back and I'll share with you uh, my uh, childhood and growing up and my influences. And then I'll tell you um, where I find myself now upon looking back. And I think I'm right on the, the brink of um, starting my, what I call my, my third act. And I turned uh, 50 in January, and 50 seems to be a, a pretty good number and a way to kind of, you know, break down this presentation. Zero to 25, 25 to 50. And in going through and sharing with you all of these images, I'm very happy to go back during the questions and answer and, and give you a little more details. I'm going to gloss over a lot of the details in order to um, share with you everything that I'd like to. Um, so I'll be jumping around a bit. This is a painting that is uh, eight feet by 12 feet. And it's one of, you know, what I call the, um, what I call the mindscapes. My worlds are built in the same way in which our known universe is built, and that is upon discrete but ever-changing units. I sometimes draw the analogy um, with, with chemistry in, in the production of my work, likening these two elements. These elements get combined to uh, make compounds, and then those can both combine to make mixtures. The paintings really are the mixtures. The way I make my drawings is to start usually with a thumbnail, something very rough and something kind of sketchy. Um, and then those sketches get developed into the final forms. In going through this process, I'm trying to find the underlying geometry um, for the image. And the image ends up being very graphic and is more of a technical drawing. I'm very concerned with um, how uh, perfect these images are. And they all end up as, as vector files, um, which means that they are infinitely scalable and malleable and can be combined and recombined. And so this is um, how all of those individual drawings start. The idea is that all of these images are inspired by so many different things in my life and they combine in my own mind um, to create, you know, again, what I call these, these, these mindscapes because that's really how our, our minds work, like computers, like RAM, random access memories. Sometimes those paintings combine into something site specific like here at Miles McHenry Gallery in New York. This was a, a couple years ago.
Sometimes the drawings are inspired by images in popular culture or sometimes subcultures. This is obviously a Dead Kennedys uh, album that appropriated uh, an Associated Press photo. And this image always resonated, me, re resonated with me since, since childhood. It has found its way into my paintings. And here's an example of how it could be uh, buried within the painting. The paintings are very encoded. Here's another example of, you know, being inspired by, I'm a real sucker for pictures of pictures and art handlers. And so this picture I just came across uh, randomly inspired this drawing and the sketch process and ended up in this final drawing, which ended up in the painting. And inside the painting being held is a, uh, my version of, or, or is inspired by this painting by Magritte which is incidentally titled, uh, Not to be Reproduced. <clears throat> More examples of the sketch and drawing process. And sometimes uh, an image like this I came across in a, in a, in a book um, inspires me. This is a Mexican shaman. Mushrooms, there's a big psychedelic influence to the work, um, which we can talk about. Maybe that's a whole other separate talk. So sometimes mushrooms, um, grow within the paintings. How am I doing? Yeah, all right, all right. Mm. I'll continue. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so for instance, um, one of the reasons why I am so interested in symbols is because they, you know, symbol, symbols certainly can be more pictorial and symbolize <laughs> you know, something in a real world, but they are primarily symbolizing uh, the conceptual and, and communicate ideas. Um, and so to me, that means they have a little more image integrity because they're not premised on something that already exists. In this case, there is someone being stabbed in the back over a bag of money under an in the sketch under, um, under a work of art. There are a lot of dualities in some of the images and the drawings. Uh, at some point, the images and, and the paintings started to expand beyond the picture plane and start to invade the walls upon which they hung. This is from a Pace Prince exhibition. This was at uh, PS1 MoMA. And that is a painting and vinyl directly on the wall. The donut image is the painting. This was at uh, Deitch Projects in 2009. Some details of those paintings. I make a few different bodies of work, and these are figures obviously, and based on drawing from life. So sometimes the imagery comes from life, sometimes from imagination. This body of work is, is based on the figure, of course. This uh, demonstrates and shows the successive stages of that sketch and drawing process, starting with the initial rough sketch, ending with the final drawing on the right. And this is a, a bit of that process. After I have those final drawings, which are again, are vector files, they exist in, as digital files. Um, they're materialized as film. The film is then burned into screens and we use the screens to make the paintings. So that's the process in a nutshell. And I love working with all kinds of different materials. In this case, I. It's porcelain baked enamel, a material I've worked with for over 20 years. I love it. The um, old subway signs are made out of porcelain baked enamel on steel. And here are uh, neon, neon figures. This was also at Pace Prints. This was a project I did for the US government. It was a commission. This is at the border of US and Mexico. Um, at the port of entry in uh, San Ysidro, south of uh, San Diego. And this is an example of another body of work where I made a set of drawings 
um, that was specific for this project. In this case, I looked at the surrounding area and the history and the culture and made a set of drawings that then in like a freeze wrapped this building. This is another example of a separate body of work and a project and a set of drawings made specifically for um, the US Embassy in, in Taiwan. And so I made a set of drawings. I think there were a hundred, um, again, based on the history and the culture, and then combined those drawings together in the paintings. Uh, these are what I call uh, studio views, and I'll show you more of those. This is when the work starts to kind of fold in on itself, becomes a little self-reflective. These are actually cyanotypes, speaking of different materials. So these are um, burned in the, in the sun, exposed in the sun. It's a, it's a cameraless photographic process. And, and these are from another body of work that I call the black holes. This is a porcelain baked enamel on steel edition um, that was published by Exhibition A. This is about uh, 15 inches in height. But you can see just how juicy and glossy that material is. It's very, it's very sturdy, it's very durable, but it's also very um, fragile. If you look at old subway signs, for instance, the corners are chipped off. It's essentially glass, it's porcelain enamel. Anyway, I love that material. And this is also an example of me working more as an art director and working with a fabricator. And while I'm not making this work, you know, with my own hands, I'm working um, with a fabricator, an expert in this material and going through more of an, an approval process. So we can address the fact that there's this whole range of how one or how artists make work. This was a project with Long Champ in Paris, this, this is um, their headquarters. Um, they were renovating the whole building and asked if I'd be interested in wrapping the whole building. These are details of, of my paintings. I've always been interested in this idea of worlds within worlds and, and um, this kind of fractal based um, model of really the universe. And so I was, I was very interested in kind of blowing up, you know, microscopic details of the paintings very large. This was an exhibition at Quint Gallery um, in La Jolla near San Diego, where I enlarged my thumbnails, which are essentially the symbols for the paintings, and painted them on the wall, and then hung the paintings on top. And we didn't tell anybody, it was like a, like a secret show. But again, the idea is that these are for me, symbols of the paintings. This is actually a, a much more recent painting. I think I finished this last year. I've been incorporating metal leaf more and more into the paintings. This is uh, seven feet by 15 feet. Again, seven feet by 15 feet. This is a triptych. This will be in an exhibition I have next, this fall at Miles McHenry Gallery in New York. These are details. I'm finding areas within images to create windows into other worlds. Um, and it, again, that's very much like and reflects the psychedelic experience of going in and worlds within worlds. These are, uh, this is another detail of that painting. Oh, okay, so check this out. This is a project I did called Art History is Not Linear. And this was the, with the uh, Virginia Museum of Fine Art. And this is another example of making a very discrete body of work and a set of images um, for a particular project. So with this project, I, um, and I've done this with a few different museums, so these aren't necessarily specific to that museum, but these are specific to the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. I made a set of drawings based on objects in their collection and then collaged them back 
together into a series of paintings and thereby folding the collection in on itself. And so this is an example of one of those paintings. And here you can see how that one painting is reverse engineered. And I'm showing you my drawing, which is based on a specific artwork. In some cases, they're not symbols of the artwork, but they're inspired by the chosen artworks. In the case of this Dwayne Hansen sculpture, you can see I just chose parts of the sculpture, the glasses, the tie, the watch, the pocket protector. These paintings are at the Virginia Museum of Fine Art and a set of 16 of those paintings hang in their foyer. I love making books and I make all kinds of books from artist books to uh, catalogs for museums and galleries, which are largely premised on reproduction. Um, and then sometimes I'll make books that are just about one topic in particular or, or relate to a specific body of work or a specific project. This is one of those books, it's called Studio Manual. It accompanied an, an exhibition I did in Madrid at La Casa Encendida. And it's uh, accompanied uh, this exhibition where I recreated my studio in the museum. And the idea was that I was going to franchise the studio practice and you could buy a franchise of the studio. And you would also get a studio manual, which was a, a, a parody, but also had real information. So it's a parody of these kind of visual identity standards or standard manuals that a lot of corporations will create to ensure that their brands uh, and their brand assets and their logos adhere to a set of standards, of course, so that they're reproduced with consistency and also outline maybe some of the brand messaging for a corporation. So my studio manual did that for my studio. And in it, you have you know, the story for outward communications, the long version, the short version, shows my, my sketch process, how to make the drawings. And it covers production standards and how to even screw in D-rings on the back of paintings, some formats, some formatting for the signature, even how to clean the studio with cross-hatching with the mop, how to compress the trash. So I love making books. I'm always making books. This was an exhibition at Deitch Projects um, with these tondos that um, cantilevered off the wall. Um, kind of echoing signage. And here was a public art project um, where I matched the colors of the existing lamp posts and had these series of signs. The idea was that the signage would be a little more subversive and would blend into the background. And you want, you'd have to do a, a double take and really investigate the imagery and to try to decode it. Oh, and this was a project I actually, a sanctioned project with the Department of Transportation in New York City, where 50 of these signs made out of sign materials were hung throughout Manhattan. These are signs I did with Library Street Collective in Detroit uh, for a skate park. Um, that was designed by Tony Hawk. Here's Tony Hawk. I love signs. Uh, this is uh, from what I would call the Mindscape. This uh, painting is uh, eight feet square. Oh, this was at the Cincinnati Art Museum. These are the um, black holes painted in fluorescent uh, paint and hung on top of fluorescent vinyl um, displayed under black light. The black holes really developed out of my interest in symbols for wealth and fanciness. So I started looking at a lot of heraldry and crests and 
uh, fleur de lis and flourishes, and I wanted to make the fanciest paintings possible. So I isolated those flourishes and just layered them upon each other. And they have this with with one center, so they're radiating and they're pulling you in. And I wanted to make the most luxurious luxury goods possible. So that's how the black holes developed. Uh, this was uh, art positions at uh, Art Basel, Miami Beach. Um, oh, this is a series of skateboards that are bolted together, fanned out like a flower. These are laser cut and painted. This is uh, also at Deitch Projects, a, a mirror maze in which uh, all of my icons and drawings um, are displayed out with adhesive vinyl and the idea is that you'd be kind of lost in this world of icons and symbols. Another painting about eight feet by 12 feet. I'm really glossing over some of the details of these paintings, but they're all early 21st century. This is a four foot square painting. This was at Gallery du Jour in Paris. Here you see the imagery escaping the picture planes. This is a series of buttons. This is about six foot square. Um, these are some of the details. A recent project, well, I've been working on it for about five years, I'm, I'm going to finish this year, um, is where I looked at Warhol's flower paintings from 1964. I've been obsessed with these flower paintings. Uh, you know, there's enough here for a whole other talk, but I'll just tell you briefly that I think they're largely misunderstood, and I've been obsessed with them, and I want to do my version of them. And so Warhol looked at um, modern photography issue. It was June 1964. And this was um, an article. Well, this is one of the, I'm working on a book about this as well. But one of the assertions that I want to make in the book is that the, the, the content of these flower paintings is not actually flowers. But the source imagery was from an article that was about Kodak's latest imaging technology at the time. And so the article shows, you know, a color printout from this machine that happened to be about flowers because it showed the fidelity of the, the image production. And so my assertion is that the real content of these paintings and the real subject matter is that they're about the latest imaging technology at the time. And that's even more Warholian than flowers. Um, and there's more about the flowers that I think are really misunderstood. They were made more um, subversively and ironically than, than, than people realize. This is the original artwork that I looked at. This is the original maquette. It's, um, you can see it's pasted up. And that's what I looked at to make my own version. So here you see all of my different iterations to figure out, well, where on the spectrum do I wanna be for my petals? Going so far as to abstract them into pure circles? Maybe not. With the grass, I looked at the grass, gridded it out. Do I want it to be a pure grid? In the end, this is the combination that I came up with. Part of the concept is to match Warhol's initial output, 1964, 1965, in terms of size and quantity. And so that puts me at almost 1,000. And it's only this year that I'm just about done. So I've already done um, a few exhibitions of this body of work. But I include this just to really share with you that I make all these different bodies of work. This was at Baldwin Gallery in Aspen. My next show at Baldwin will of course be recent work. And these are 60 inches by 40 inches acrylic paintings with metal leaf on craft paper. This is a detail, of course. This is Buzz marketing for the upcoming exhibition. This is an ad. So now let's back up. I grew up in Virginia Beach, Virginia, and was born 50 years ago. <laughs> I grew up 
uh, making things, making our own Halloween costumes, making toys. I was in Scouts. We built a dinosaur in our front yard. Uh, the My birth announcement was made by my mom and it was a, a stenciled spray paint announcement. This is me and my sister. My kindergarten report card. His work is very neat and he is a hard worker. I like to think that's still true. I grew up playing soccer and I played for my city and we traveled up and down the East Coast. And at the end of every match, what we would do is the custom was to trade with the other team, these little simplified iconic picture planes and collect patches and trade patches with each other. This was these uh, icons, these mini pictures used as a kind of currency for goodwill. This is some of my mother's work. She made crafts. So I grew up with crafts and craft projects all over the house. And that's still kind of how I run my studio. I have a bunch of different projects going on at the same time. I mean, the point is here that you presumably see the influence. Right? <laughs> I was fortunate enough to go to um, a school for gifted and talented kids and study art. And in that program, I learned that art was a real discipline. It was, it was, it was very uh, difficult program. And in fact, this was uh, one of our tests, analyzing Marc Chagall painting. Um, but the point is that from an early age, it was instilled in me that art was a serious pursuit. And in fact, I even remember not being allowed to go out to um, recess because I had, hadn't finished my still life drawing. And this is a, we'll call it an early etching. At this point, I'm 12 years old, just we're, we're, all, we're getting through it, right? But I never, or maybe I took a few, went through public school and I took a few um, public school art courses and like most of you, you, you probably get a sense of how seriously those classes are taken. They're, they're an easy A, right? They're usually like an elective. And so most of my art education was at this other school. Um, so even from an early age, I kind of saw this disconnect from how art was regarded versus how it possibly could be taken more seriously. Oh, this is also 12 years old. And from, from an early age, I was really interested in, you know, not only art, but how art could communicate. A plus. <laughs> this junior high yearbook spread shows me in the computer club and the art club. And I like to think that I'm still in both of those clubs. Growing up in Virginia Beach, big surf skate culture, and I learned from an early age the power of these icons and these logos and these brands. And I really couldn't afford a lot of these surf shirts and the cool clothes. And I was interested in making my own. And in making my own skateboards and t-shirts, they were celebrated and other people wanted them. And that was a very empowering feeling. So this is kind of the, some, some of the celebrated imagery, some of the celebrated brands. The power of the right graphic, the right artwork on what would otherwise be an ordinary t-shirt or skateboard. Um, you, you know, that was the, the value was transformed through the artwork. The experience of going into the skate shop and differentiating between all the different skateboards based on the imagery. It's not unlike the museum or gallery experience of going in looking at oil on wood panels. I was involved in school government. And I think what interested me most about that was the propaganda materials that I got to make. 
This was a display from a, in, in high school, high school artwork. I was really into Dada and I found this book in the local library about Dada and that had a big influence on me. I was also in a bedroom band with a friend and we made flyers and you can see the influence of Dada. But I remember also going, you know, when you're in high school, you do these uh, portfolio um, interviews with the, with the universities and the schools you might want to go to. And I remember going to, I went to um, well, all of those and talking to a professor and saying, oh, have, you, have you heard of Dada? And of course they had, and it just blew me because I, I had the book. And I, I just couldn't understand how someone else knew about this, this, this art movement. You know, I'm not really that naive, but it really kind of blew me away. And so even in, on our like uh, little music cassette covers, this is um, a, a Dada woodcut print and t-shirt. I was also fortunate enough in high school to get a job at the one of the local um, Air Force bases. And I worked as an artist illustrator making signs and menus and all of the, you know, uh, print material needed um, for, for the Air Force Base. Oh, this is an early silkscreen piece. Maybe this was senior year high school. And I was enthralled with uh, photocopiers. All I wanted growing up was a photocopier. So this is some of my double exposure photocopy work from that time. And so in, in making, you know, all of these different things, I came to learn that there was a discipline behind all of this. And that discipline was called graphic design. And that's what I craved. I wanted something real to learn, real rules and regulations. And I learned that it's called graphic design. So I went to Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I wanted to go and have more of a, a university experience. I know some of you, I also, was gonna to go to RISD. Some of you are RISD people here. I like to say RISD was my safety school. But I got a better deal, actually. I got a scholarship to Carnegie Mellon. And my mother told me, you know, Andy Warhol went to Carnegie Mellon. So went off to Carnegie Mellon and, and into their graphic design program where I did tons of these basic design studies, line studies like these. This is a cut paper and um, placa which is a, a very opaque pigment. But these are the kind of wax on, wax off exercises you do as a design student. And you, you know, they drive you crazy. You're not quite sure why you're doing it until you actually have to design something real. And then you understand how to make tension within a picture plane and lay things out. Positive, negative space studies. But I loved, I loved this. I still love this. This was a, a logo I made in, uh, in school and so, in typography exercises. Here you can even see some of the layering of the information. Um, I was the design editor of our student literary magazine. This is a cover I designed. Typography assignment based on Gill Sands. So you can see some of the kind of influence throughout those years. And then these are some additional influences, of course. I'm now looking at a lot of artists uh, from Eastern Europe, kind of uh, 1920s, 1930s. Gerd Arntz. A lot of the artists ex distilling the world around them at this time were making these kinds of isotope or, or icons, pictograms, um, images that simplified the world around them into um, legible images. The work was so successful at communicating that a lot of it was co-opted you know, by the state and used, utility was attached to these images and these drawings um, because they were so good at communicating. And this was about the time when um, the field of graphic design was becoming a little more formalized. 
Otto Eicher, Augustin Schinkel, Mother and Child, more Gerd Arntz. And so that's zero to 25. Um, my then girlfriend, now wife, Trish Goodwin, and I moved to New York, 1994. That puts us at about 25. But at that time, this I uh, started making what I now, I mean, looking back, kind of call Act One. And in Act One, which is 94 to maybe 2001, I was making a lot of what some people would call conceptual art, but I really describe as just neat idea art. So this is me shaving my head and then mirroring the sides of my face. Oh, I'm sorry, these are um, army men, a little plastic toy soldier army men, which I was of course regarded as little symbols of soldiers. This is a skateboard ramp made out of cardboard writing my name in the snow. I was building forts in my studio out of my paintings, making trophies and assigning them to myself. I won most improved artist. This is a, a video piece I did called Hour of Power, where you take a shot of beer every minute for an hour, you see the consequence. This was a Michelin man I painted. This is like 1990, 1993. This was a project I did called Networking is a Skill, where I mapped out everybody I know and how I know them. This is how hyperspace works. And this is a speech bubble, of course, with a uh, computer pointer, um, silk screened multiple times. And it's about this time too, where I continued my interest in uh, clip art. So clip art is imagery and drawings in the public domain, which everybody has rights to them. And I first really discovered clip art at, my, at that job at the, uh, the military base where I, I was drawing an illustration to accompany some flyer. And my boss said to me, oh, you don't need to make drawing. Oh, we have these, volumes and volumes of this clip art that you could just cut out and find. They're organized according to different themes like party or women's heads or, you know, vehicles or whatever. Became obsessed with clip art and I started making this body of work, even starting in, in, in school. Um, that was based on this idea of the whole idea for me was to take these anonymously created objects from the public domain and give them a fine art context, to give them a kind of authorship. And at this time, I was also really obsessed with um, simulation, Beaujard, simulacrum. So I studied graphic design, but I also studied art, but all my art courses were, were lectures and uh, more about art philosophy. In this piece, the painting is made on clear stretched plastic and you don't see the primary surface, you see a reflection because the painting is backed with mirror. So I really got caught up of all, in, in all of these ideas with simulation and reproductions of reproductions. Again, this is clip art imagery. This is six foot square from the same time, layering those found clip art appropriated images. This is a painting of a drawing painted on translucent plastic where you see the, the shadow and the shadow image competes with the primary image. I started painting on skateboards and this is around 2000, uh, the year 2000. This is one of my first shows, I think it's 2000 or 2001 where I um, put these drawings on skateboards and it was also around the time that I did this uh, collaboration with Supreme, um, where it was a, a, a mass produced uh, skateboards. Actually, I think they're addition of 500 each, but I used a common tool, Pantone swatch book from the graphic design world, brought it into a fine art context or more like a skating context, but then I in turn included it in my exhibitions.
the real point is that I started to become more comfortable with embracing my graphic design background and skills and studies and employing those into my paintings. Because up to this point, the pursuits were really separate. And I did a lot of graphic design work just to stay alive when we first moved to New York. This is a mural at um, a boutique and slash art gallery called A Life that was in the Lower East Side. And these are porcelain baked enamel pieces. These are four foot square, about two and a half inches deep. And this is around 2000, 2001. And it's at this time where the work shifts and starts to enter, starts to enter what I would call act two, where I'm, I'm more interested in embracing graphic imagery and furthermore, original images. And I start employing the sketch process that I would use in design to make the artwork for the paintings. And that's a big dis, uh, distinction with what I do and kind of, I would say like most artists coming from a graphic design background, I make artwork for artwork. So of course, design is largely premised on the idea of making a plan and making the ingredients to make something. And that's largely what I do. I make all of the artwork for the artwork. And this is that, that, that process of one of those drawings again. This was at Deitch Project. This was a two-person show with Julia Chang. It was called Dream Garden. And one of the first times where I actually painted directly on the wall and also included adhesive vinyl on the wall. Sarah, the, there are these little worlds within the larger worlds. And I've always been interested in these extreme scale shifts. Again, that kind of reflect this uh, fractal based model of, of the universe. This was at La Casa Encendida. Um, here you see some of those black holes, mindscapes and uh, a mural I did. I go back and forth between isolated and singular images or more legible images and then very layered, almost illegible picture planes. This was a Cincinnati Art Museum. This was at Phillips. Again, they're the black holes. They are um, made with this uh, fluorescent a black light reactive paint. And then there's vinyl on the wall behind those. Just again, trying to make the fanciest paintings possible. This was a print published by um, Pace Prints. This is about 60 inches by 40 inches. This was at Quint Gallery. This was part of the Beautiful Losers exhibition at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati. And here again, you see that the paintings, the imagery in the paintings are kind of escaping the picture plane, bleeding onto the walls, providing a context for those worlds, for the paintings. So within the past five to six years, I started making these, what I call studio views. And this is when the work really started to fold in on itself. I started to recognize that I was making Ryan McGinnis paintings and that the paintings were kind of becoming symbolic objects in and of themselves. And so I wanted to make though, I wanted to paint those symbols. So this, these are not reproductions of existing paintings, but they're primary productions. And I like how the composition and the, and the format reads as if they're reproductions, but in fact, they're primary productions. I, 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 I love that they exist in, bo in both states at the same time. These are about seven feet by uh, five feet. And it's um, my studio floor. The paintings are resting on paint buckets in the studio. Oh, so this is another example of where the work, the work really starts to fold in on itself. The 
Um, these are screens. This is a maze made out of used silk screens. This is at the Cranbrook Art Museum. And these are studio views that accompany that exhibition. This was at Cone Gallery in Los Angeles. So these studio views really represent and became for me a kind of dead end or a cul-de-sac. And I wasn't quite sure where to go from this dead end or how to get out of the dead end. But I continued to make them in all different variations because it was still very stimulating as there's, there's still a lot to learn. These are tools that are used in the studio. The, even these studio views started to fold in on themselves. And so you have a painting of a painting that includes another painting, but then these yellow forms, which are sawhorses, and I use those in the studio, are holding another painting that span those other two paintings, but could only possibly exist in a um, higher dimension of the painting. And here the work really starts to fold in on itself in this diptych, which is seven feet by 10 feet. And here it gets even a little bit wilder with this with the scale shifts. These uh, you can see some of the squeegees. That's what those are, and uh, paint containers, and even I mean, even was even including some of the uh, my photographer's hands with the color chart in the paintings. But at this point, I'm just getting so wrapped up with with the work folding in on itself, and uh, you know simultaneously and maybe even a few years before I was doing this other body of work based on mother and child. And this is an example of that drawing process. This is the final drawing, of course. And this is Trish with Maxine on a train. I had taken this snapshot and then later looked at it and one decided to make a, a drawing out of it and then use this drawing as the basis for a painting. And it's the first time where I'm starting to make a picture. This is another example of mother and child based on a snapshot. And here are some of the details of that painting. These are the books that are in the, in the background on the bookcase, of course, and even including some other work, of course. All right, so get this. Pablo Picasso came to me in a dream and brought me, Girl Before a Mirror, a painting I love. I, of course, I already knew about it. And I didn't think much of it, but I did wake up and we have a modest collection of Picasso books and I started pulling them out and looking at it. The date of creation of Girl Before a Mirror was the same day that I had the dream, March 14th. The painting was made in 1932. And I'm not the kind of person at all to believe in those kinds of coincidences too much. And yet still, it was a bit much to understand and embrace, but I did decide to embrace and I thought I got to make my own version of this painting. And so this is what that process looks like. This, this actually took about four years, not working on it every day or every week, but this was always a project, you know, one of those many projects that's kicking around in the studio. So I wanted to make my version of Girl Before a Mirror. In the end, I decided to flip it or mirror it and it's mirror before a girl, after girl before a mirror. This is the final drawing. This is some of the, the process. I made 10 paintings. They're all one-to-one -one scale with the original. I was interested in making what I call kind of control group paintings. There's no one masterpiece. And that was um, 
of course, a gesture in response to the idea of the, the masterpiece. And this is a masterpiece painting. So I made 10 versions. Here are a few of them. So in making the mother and child paintings, where I'm starting to make more narrative work, starting to make pictures, in making the studio views, which is really my first time in making a space within the a painting. Again, those were kind of symbolic paintings with a background and they exist in a space. And there's this narrative. How did that painting get there? Why is it there? They're still very formal in their composition. But in making those and in making the Picassos, it brought me out of that cul-de-sac. And I learned a lot, of course, from making those. For instance, from the Picassos, I came to terms with using line in my work, which I know might sound really silly, but I have always refused to outline my work uh, or outline the images that go into the work for a number of reasons. But to me, it, it, it's just conceptually illogical because lines don't really exist, right? They, as soon as you materialize or visualize a line, it becomes a shape. And I just kind of got hung up on that. So I got over my hang up on working with lines. And so I've started making what I call the third act. And these are more narrative pictures. I also, within the past few years, started to try to see the work as others see it and have drawn some startling conclusions. I don't, I, 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 you know, one doesn't make work for an audience, but might be nice to see the work as other people see it. And I think my work has just been a mess and just really hard to get into. I see what's going on because I'm so intimately familiar with all the little details and all the little images. But I also recognize that there really hasn't been a like a welcome mat to the paintings. And so I want to make for lack of a better term, friendlier paintings. So I'm making what I call the new narratives. And that's the title of my show in the, this, this fall at Miles McHenry Gallery. They are narrative pictures. And this is what I'm working on right now. And I'd like to show you some of those. And then also what I'm working on are these charcoal drawings, which are based on another idea I've been grappling with and that has to do with incorporating a degree of theatrics in the work and actually lying with the work. And we can talk about that more. I'm almost, I'm almost done. Um, so I'll zip through some of these new narratives. They're mostly based on the world immediately around me, which includes our offspring, So this is, the, this is the final artwork for the painting. The painting is still in progress and this is what it looks like right now. It's not, it's not anywhere near where I want it to be. So bear that in mind, it's in progress. In fact, don't, don't even look at it, just <laughs> um, this, this I'm working on another painting called Highbrow. During the pandemic, Trish and I used to make beer a long time ago when we first moved to New York and couldn't afford to buy beer. So of course we learned how to make beer for ourselves. Um, and then we picked it up again during the pandemic and the girls were involved in that process and they loved making beer. And this is what some of that sketch and drawing process looks like to come up with the picture. And I'm starting to work on the painting now. And there's one more example of the new narratives. This is called the spaghetti eater. This is that final drawing for the painting. And this is the painting in progress. But again, this is 
this is not anywhere near where I want it to be, but it's in progress, you get the idea. Mm -hmm. And I'm also working on a series of charcoal drawings. That's what I brought with me here to Atlantic Center for the Arts. These charcoal drawings I started during the pandemic when everything shut down and everyone had to be quarantined, but I would sneak into the studio. I live an eight minute walk away. And one of the things I could do by myself, because I need a lot of help with making my paintings, is work on drawings. And with everything going on in the world and listening to radio all day, it, it, it was just so depressing how um, that guy was handling everything for our country. And it really brought into question this idea of what is, of course, the truth and who gets to control what the truth is. And it's something I've been thinking about with the work anyway. So I started to make these charcoal drawings, which as you can see, are me figuring out where the forms are and really working the imagery and erasing and going through this process of figuring out the drawing. And you see that process, you see the erasure, you see the buildup, you see you know, the breaking down of the forms, you see the search, right? And this actually is based on this. But what I'm getting at, and the real point is, that's all a lie. These are just tracings. And I print them out in very thin lines. And I make these marks, which to me are complete lies. And that's what this work is all about. Adding a degree of theatrics, which I, was never ever comfortable with because I always championed art as the truth. And so lately I've been thinking about, it's not. The end. And I believe the idea now is to give answers to questions. Yeah, uh, so anybody who would like to ask a question, both online and in person, if it's in person, please go up to a mic. And again, I tore through over 300 slides, so I'm happy to go back and revisit any of the images and give more details on anything, of course. Well, uh, I'll start it off, actually. I do have a question. Well, two questions. Uh, number one, uh, do you have a legend associated to your... Uh, symbolism or iconography and question two is can you like in particular the one that you did for the embassy in taiwan can you give us an example of what that one symbol means in their culture and how you oh sure it? so to answer your first question i have started to organize my entire vocabulary of forms it's a good time to do it now because i'm transitioning of course to making more picture-based symbols, right? Where I'm addressing the whole picture plane. Um, so now's a good time for me to kind of stop those, organize them. And I do organize them into different categories. I don't necessarily attribute concrete meanings to a lot of them because a lot of them are you know, more poetic and open to interpretation, but some of them are more concrete. Like in uh, working on this project, um, uh, the ta Taiwan-based work which I, I actually can show you. I think I have a satisfying answer in this document. So these are all of the 100 drawings. And um, I mean, I'll spare you the details, but I have kind of outlined all the different meanings and, and, the, and the sources um, for those 100. And here's one of those.
Um, that's a that's a quick answer and without giving any real details, but you can see some specific examples of the individual drawings here. Yeah, thank you for sharing on that. Who else? What else? Can you talk a little bit about uh, the marks you were making that you consider to be like fictional and mm -hmm. like that uh, kind of uh, work with the charcoal drawings? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So these charcoals, charcoal drawings, just to clarify, um, are printed out because the <clears throat> what I'm implying with these forms and these marks is that I'm finding the drawing by going through the process of making the drawing. And in fact, these drawings are already resolved. I've already figured it out and they exist again as kind of a vector file. So I'm printing them out just as thin lines um, and then embellishing them. And so one way I've kind of come to terms with that is to liken the original drawing as like the score or the code, the score for a song. And then this is one expression of that song. So that's helped me become comfortable with these. Or this is the drawings really are the computer code. This is just another expression, just as the paintings are another way to express those codes. I'll piggyback on that one. Um, I'm interested, or I'm curious, if there's a relationship between these drawings and the show that you did where you painted behind the paintings. Oh, the, uh, yeah, there, I mean, there absolutely is, not only in the, in, in the secrecy, and I think you're talking about the, the enlarged uh, thumbnail sketches, right? Okay, so let me see if I can find those. But um, aside from the superficial relationship, I mean, they're both drawings, right? Um, I would say that the hidden thumbnail sketches are more to do with symbolizing the paintings, right? Um, yes, they're kind of the, 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 the thumbnail sketch is the initial and primary source. And then the painting is one example of how that could be expressed. So I could go back to um, those thumbnails and make another painting based on that composition. So in those thumbnails, I'm, I'm really only sorting out and figuring out the um, composition. And so I guess they're compositional codes. So now that I'm talking about it, it seems like they do relate more than I thought. Um, and again, let me see if I could find those. But in the meantime, who else has a question? Uh, we, we got uh, a couple online, so. Uh, question, do you ever want to stop silk screening and go freehand? Oh, you know, I, I, I do. Um, the, the paintings do have a lot of brushwork in them, but they're usually for grounds and, 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 and um, you know, solid colors. Um, but I assume the question's about like creating imagery by freehand. Well, you know, I, I do that in the sketch drawing process. Um, so, so the initial drawings are, you know, they're, they're drawn by, you know, freehand, right? So here are some examples of figures, you know, here are the sketches, um, but that, that doesn't really do it for me. You know, I need to then symbolize the sketches. That's as far as I will get, right? Because I feel like um, there's still a lot of uh, subjective forms and su subjective imagery making in the in the hand drawn process. And what I ultimately want to do is create a symbol, a graphic drawing that erases the hand, that almost looks as if it were anonymously created, and therefore has a little more authority over you. Uh, the next question is: On average, how long does a painting take? from conceptual drawings through completion and how many assist, assistants will you have working on them? So um, of course it varies, but the longest part of the process is, is the drawing, is in making, again, the artwork for the artwork. If I'm working on a painting from start to finish without any breaks, it's like uh, uh, three or four weeks, right? To make a large painting. 
Um, but these flowers, for instance, I've been wor working on for five years. Um, the Picasso paintings took about four years. And so I tend not to work on one continuous painting or even body of work all the, straight through. Um, but, and that allows me a little more time to contemplate and, and reassess what's going on. Um, but it's also very frustrating. And so I'm, I'm, I'm constantly trying to catch up to myself and um, assistance help with that. So Miss Gina Kim, whom you met at the beginning, um, runs the studio and is really in charge of everything. And without her, I would be lost. In addition to Gina, we'll bring on just like two or three other people, um, depending on what our production needs are. So actually Gina's working with one other person in the studio while I'm here. Um, but the process is such that, you know, silk screening requires, um, yeah, not only the making of the screens and there's always the stretching of the canvases and the sanding and adjusting and all of that, but the process of screening requires that the screens are washed and, uh, and dried. And the idea when we are in full on production mode is that I can keep going and, and keep the flow of work. So I, the process is usually, uh, the paintings are always built very intuitively. I don't really have a plan for them. And so I'm selecting screens and have some idea of where the images are. The studio is full of all different screens and we try to keep them organized, pick up the screen, figure out where it is. It's usually one poll. Maybe I'll kind of amortize that effort over a few different paintings because I work on a few different paintings in parallel, hand it off. Um, someone washes it, I pick up another screen, fans are going. It's all acrylic paint, it's all water-based, so they're drying really quickly. The idea is to keep that flow going so that I can stay in the work. I got a couple more questions online. Do you ever destroy work from your past? Oh, absolutely. Uh, often, uh, for a number of different reasons. It could just, the simplest reasons, it's damaged beyond repair and must be destroyed, sometimes for insurance purposes, and you document that destruction. Um, I will edit out work I don't like. Sometimes when working on paintings, they just go off in a direction Sometimes the painting wins, it's like a fight, right? Sometimes the painting wins and I have to sand it down and start over. So often, often destroying work. Yeah, and I'm very prolific, I make a lot of work. I don't make a lot of work available, but I'm an empirical learner and the process of making the paintings, um, you know, inspires ideas for other paintings. I love working with new materials and figuring things out. So I have to make a lot, right? So I, I do destroy a lot. Uh, the other question is, uh, can you speak about the book NFT Art NFS? Oh yeah, so I'm working on a book now. Uh, and if the NFT primer, right? I'm, it's not, not a lot to say, I'm working on a book about NFTs. I'm by no means an expert at all. I have three unsold NFTs available. I'm not in that world, I'm not in that market, but I've got some ideas about them. So um, when everyone was super excited about NFTs, I guess it was about two years ago in the spring, I started getting all these calls and people reaching out like, oh, you gotta check this out, you should do this and you should get on Clubhouse and I had to get a new phone because I couldn't get that app and I just, and it really uh, grabbed onto me. I was just so obsessed with it because because the it's just, it's just so interesting. I think it's so, I think it's more philosophically interesting than it is in practice. There are a lot of problems um, with it in the marketplace and, and whatnot, but it's, it's just so interesting. So I started writing down a lot of my thoughts and posting them on Instagram and um, talking to a lot of people. And um, anyway, consequently, I'm, I'm working on a book and trying to clean up some of those ideas. I, one of the reasons I love making books is so that I can, you know, quite literally close the chapter on something and set it aside. And I'm kind of done with this topic. I'm ready to make a book out of it and, and then not open the book again. That's one of the reasons I love making books. It's in progress, working on it, maybe this fall. I don't know. I love me. I'm working on this whole, so many other books at the same time too. Anyway. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
about the first hundred slides. I've noticed <laughs> the how... first hundred, yes. Yes, <laughs> I was enjoying how differently you exhibited your work in a very um, different way. Sometimes paintings on the wall, sometimes more sculptural three-dimensional pieces, sometimes printmaking. So I and then bookmaking and like sketches, drawing, symbols, everything. So I'm curious how these are the neon and then the piece that you showed on the building, how all of these happened? Did it come to you mm -hmm. or did you personally wanted to practice it first? How the idea came to you and how did you examine the whole process before exhibiting them at the galleries and museums? Yeah, and, and, and usually it's a combination. You know, there are opportunities that do come to me that spark my interest and I accommodate the, those and they lead me down a path like working with neon. I'm by no means a neon artist, but I thought it was a great opportunity to work with paste prints for them to pay for the production of the work and work with a fabricator. Again, it was kind of more of a, my role was really more of an art director in that situation. And um, I forgot exactly how that project came about, um, but it wasn't initiated by me, for example. Um, the porcelain baked enamel work I just fell in love with that material from being in New York City and seeing the subway signs and just seeing subway signs and signage all around the world. And so I researched, okay, who makes that? How can I make my own? And um, I found the fabricator and I've been working with him for a number, I mean, almost 20 years. So that was born out of my interest in the material. Um, the Longchamp project, they reached out to me and we talked about what to do and how to do it. Uh, the commission with the, with the US government, they uh, came to me, that came out of the blue. Um, yeah, it's not a very satisfying answer, but it's both, you know, yeah. Hi Ryan. So speak about where you say you don't paint in lines or you don't use mm -hmm. lines. I, I see so many lines. It might be just big, swirly, antennae looking objects. But are you just talking about outlines of Yeah, I'm images? primarily, I'm sorry, I'm primarily talking about outlines. Okay. So if we look at a detail of a painting, let's say here, for example, you'll notice that these are all, these forms mm -hmm. are all defined by shapes. Right. And that's because you don't need anything more than a shape within a field of two different colors to define that shape within the field, if that makes any sense. And so to yeah. outline these drawings, I always thought it was completely illogical. Yeah. You know, I, the, I, out, the outline, and you, it was, I mean, a lot of my favorite artists use big, um, bold black outlines and they're, and, and the paintings are really punchy and I'm trying to, trying to get there with my own work. Um, but it just never really made sense to me until recently, right? And even now, I'm not quite where I am. <laughs> it sounds so ridiculous and no, no, I even saying, esoteric, but, but, even, but I'm not where I want to be with lines because I'm not fully exploiting the potential of the different thicknesses. But swirls, you don't consider those Oh, lines. the flourishes, I see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, I never, I never thought of those, those as lines. lines. I really only saw, thought of those as solid forms. Well, yeah. you're almost there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> If you have ever uh, recontextualized an already existing symbol? Oh, only one that has existed in the public domain. Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And that's just kind of one of my own hangups, right? I'm not a big fan of appropriation. I really believe in original contributions to culture. And that's just one of my hangups and I'm not sure it's even correct, you know? But that's just been my mindset. Do you consider yourself a minimalist? No, more of a maximalist. And I, you know, I, I think you, you, you know, you see that in like a painting like this, for instance. But, but it is a good question because, you know, like I said before, I go, I go back and forth, and you know, I still love, you know, singular images on a clean field, um, which I used to do more and more of, like in something like this. Which, granted, it's very small, but um, even this is more recent, right? And so this is a lot more legible. 
Um, I just I, I go back and forth. Well, the reason for my question is because you 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 look at these um, pictures, photographs, and you just get down to the essence of it, and that's why it brought to me is like, do you ever thought of yourself as a minimalist? Um, maybe you know, in, in in the way that I live, I don't I don't really have a lot or need a lot, and really only like to keep around the things that I essentially need. But now now I see what you're saying more clearly. In in the in the initial forms, I'm definitely distilling the forms down to their minimalist forms, right? Um, so in that regard, yes, I guess so, you know. Um, but then again, those really are just the ingredients for what become more often well, maximalist have, paintings. Yeah. I have two more questions online. This is, a, do you prefer metal leaf or fluorescent paint? Uh, right now I'm really in the metal leaf. Um, trying to find, okay, just as an example of what we were just talking about. But also, let me find a detail of one of the recent metal leaf paintings. And, you know, the way we silk screen in the studio or the way I approach silk screen is it's not the way you're supposed to silk screen. You know, I don't concern myself with registration marks or hinges, and I don't use these tools um, with the idea of reproduction in mind, right? Um, so I don't silk screen the right way. And I mention that because we also don't metal leaf the correct way. Um, so in the metal leaf community, or those who know metal leafing, um, you, you really want to see some of the broken edges and you want to see the craft, but we obliterate the surface with even two layers of metal leaf and overlap so that we get these solid glossy, shiny, reflective metallic surfaces, which is, which is not really how you're supposed to metal leaf. But I love the effect. You can kind of see it in this one where we are even creating um, a texture and a pattern behind the metal leafing. You know, these sheets of metal leaf are, leaf are just um, microns thin, and they conform to every little nook and cranny and really um, exploit the, um, the differences in the surface more than than your than your eye does if it weren't metal leafed. So we get some really um, juicy, visually viscous effects with metal leaf over patterns. Uh, let's see, here's another little example. Uh, so the short answer is metal leaf. I'm really into metal leafing right now. <laughs> so the uh, next question is, obviously you uh, did this in school, but how do you feel now about letter form language and do you ever work letter form shapes into your work? Uh, that's a great question because I love typography. I study typography and I've got a lot of hangups and pet peeves whenever I see type in fine art because nobody really does it that well. And I'm often inspired by what I don't like. And for the longest time, I, I've, <laughs> I've just been wanting to incorporate typography. I think that's, I'm just on the brink of, of doing it more and more. You could see it in some of the, like the details of the book spines, for instance, in that um, one mother and child painting. Um, my, um, my typography work. And these books, incidentally, um, are all fictitious. Um, and this goes back to the idea about appropriation. I don't want to, you know, I'm creating my own world. Very rarely will I reference the world in which we all, we share and we inhabit. But for the most part, I wanna create and share with you my own world. And so all of my books are original titles and I'm writing down phrases in, in my sketchbook all the time and then pulling out those and typesetting them and working with typography. This is not, you know, these are not examples of radical typography, but I think I'm just about there where I will start incorporating um, type in, in a more radical way. I guess that's it. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks. Thanks.